we are going to take a look at question two from the 2010 AP Chemistry Free Response questions. And in this uh, particular question, it says a student performs an experiment to determine the molar enthalpy, so I'm thinking delta H, uh, of s some solution of urea. The student places 91.95 grams of water in, uh, at 25 degrees Celsius into a coffee cup calorimeter and immerses a thermometer in the water. After 50 seconds, the student adds 5.13 grams of solid urea, also at 25 degrees Celsius, to the water and measures the temperature of the solution as the urea dissolves. A plot of the temperature data is shown in the graph below. Okay, determine the change in temperature of the solution that results from the dissolution of the urea. So that's asking for a delta T so if we remember that delta T equals T final minus T initial, what I need to do is somehow read this. Um, and it looks like 21 to 22, we go 0 0.2, 0 0.3, not 0 0.3, but 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. So it looks like it, every hash mark is 0.2. So this looks like 21.8 degrees Celsius, and we know just from the question that we started at 25.0 degrees Celsius. So 21.8 degrees Celsius minus 25.0 degrees Celsius, that equals delta T, and that's going to equal negative 3.2 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's question A. In B, it says, according to the data, is the dissolution of urea in water an endothermic process or an exothermic process? Justify your answer. And this is a very hard question. So one thing that's important to understand is that when you have a solution and you put the thermometer in the solution, um, you're measuring the surroundings, like the water is the surroundings to whatever your urea is. If your urea is your system, water is the surroundings. So since the temperature of the surroundings um, decreased, this means the system, which is what we're studying, absorbed heat, thus the process is endothermic. I almost relate this to if you had a, a freezer and you open the freezer and you grabbed a handful of ice. The ice feels really cold to you and that's because it's the ice, the system, if that's our system, steals your heat and so it feels cold to you but notice from the ice's perspective the ice starts to melt because it's absorbing your heat okay so it's exothermic for you the surroundings but our system the ice in this scenario is definitely endothermic even though it feels cold to the surroundings okay in c we have two parts it says assume the specific heat capacity of the cal calorimeter is negligible and that the specific heat capacity of the solution of urea is 4.2 joules per gram degree Celsius. Calculate the heat of dissolution of urea in joules. So to me, this looks like a Q equals MC delta T question. A um, couple things that we got to be careful of, though, because we made a uh, solution is we'll do Q equals MC delta T. We're solving for Q, which is joules. Our mass, I'll come and talk about in just a second, but we have 4.2 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Our temperature change, a lot of people would say negative 3.2 degrees Celsius, but we're not talking about the surroundings, we're talking about the system. And so from the system's perspective, it's 3.2 degrees Celsius because we're endothermic, okay? Now, Know this and don't try to over apply it, just know it according to this rule. When you dissolve something in water and you do a calorimetry experiment, and only when you dissolve something, the M that you use needs to be the mass of your solution. So they tell us above we have 91.95 grams of water 
and then we added to it 5.13 grams of urea. So now I'll plug this into my calculator and I get 1.304 times 10 to the third joules. Then I can move on to part two, and since it's part two rather than letter D, these are mo most likely going to be related. They say calculate the molar enthalpy of the solution, delta H, in kilojoules per mole. So that's kind of annoying that they want kilojoules, but we can do that for them. We're going to remember that delta H is equal to Q over moles. Um, this is going to be 1.304 kilojoules, because we'll just divide by 1,000. That'll get rid of the times 10 to the third. And then I need to get moles. Now, here's what gets confusing. This needs to be moles of urea. So we have 5.13 grams of urea, which is H2NCO in H2. There is 60.07 grams of urea, H2NCO in H2, in one mole of urea. And when I do that, I get 0 0.0854 moles. So I'm going to now move that up here. And when I divide those, I'm going to get 15.3 kilojoules per mole for my delta H. Okay, kind of a hard... Part, letter C is definitely hard. Um, now, in D, it says, using the information in the table below, calculate the value, the molar entropy of the solution, delta S, of urea at 298 Kelvin. So understand that all we have here is we're given delta H and delta G, and a certain formula should definitely come to mind when you see both of those. And that formula is the famous Gibbs-Hemholtz equation, where we have delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. And we want to make sure delta G is in joules per mole, and we want to make sure delta H is in joules per mole. We always want joules when we're doing math. So delta G is going to be negative 6.9 kilojoules per mole, so that'll be negative 6,900 joules per mole. Delta H is 14 kilojoules per mole, so that should be uh, 14,000 joules per mole. And notice, they gave us a little hint. Very few people probably noticed this. I almost uh, skipped it. This gives me good confidence that my answer for B is correct because they said it was in, I said it was endothermic, and then the delta H that they give me is positive. Okay, that confirms that I know my thinking is probably on the right track. Um, what temperature did they want us at? We are at standard temperature, so that'll be um, 298 Kelvin. So we'll solve for delta S. The first thing you want to do is subtract over 14,000. And so I'm going to get negative 6,900 minus 14,000. And I get negative 20,900 equals negative 298 Kelvin times delta S. We'll divide by negative 298. And again, this makes sense that a delta S that I get is going to be positive because we're dissolving something. So going from solid to aqueous will definitely increase my entropy. So I get that for delta G, or excuse me, for delta S, for letter D. And then in E, they say the student repeats the experiment and this time obtains a result of delta H that is 11% below. So maybe they got um, Twelve thousand six hundred, and I think that's actually eleven percent below. Um, calculate the value of delta H that the student obtained in this second. Oh, I already did it. Eleven percent below. Let me see. I might have done it wrong. So there's a couple ways you can do this, um, and I've got a, an easy way. We get fourteen uh, kilojoules per mole. And if we got 11% below, we could multiply this by 
percent, so 0.11, so 14 times 0.11, and we get uh, 1.54, and then we could subtract it, 14 minus 1.54, and we get 12.46 uh, kilojoules per mole. And another way we could also do this, and I'll write it in red, this is just as good, is we could take 14 kilojoules per mole, and instead of saying that we had 11% air, we could say that we had an 89% yield. And when we do that, I believe we should get the same answer. And we do, we get 12.46 kilojoules per mole. So both ways are good ways, just kind of your preference. Okay, now in F, it says a student performs a third trial of the experiment, but this time adds urea that had been taken directly from a refrigerator at 5 degrees Celsius. What effect, if any, would the cold urea instead of the urea at 25 degrees Celsius have on the experimentally obtained value of delta H of the solution? Justify your answer. Okay, so since the urea is now colder, it will take more energy from the surroundings. in order to dissolve. This will lead to a more endothermic reaction. Thus, delta H would increase. You could also justify it in terms of Q equals MC delta T, that if you one of your substances starts out at a lower temperature, you're going to have a larger change in temperature. And a larger change in temperature, if you follow this all the way through with the math, will lead to a larger Q. And a larger Q, because that's in the numerator of delta H equals Q over moles, is going to lead to a larger delta H.